Hello, everybody, and welcome to the How to Hide a Dead Body podcast. Appreciate you guys joining us for another episode. This one is sure to be exciting, informational, educational, and practical. Before we begin, if you haven't gotten yourself a copy of Join or Die, Digital Advertising in the Age of Automation, it's a brand new book. I don't know, we've sold about a billion copies or something. We lost count at the, uh, the 300 million mark. It's available in hardcover, softcover, uh, uh, digital ebook, soon audiobook written by Patrick Gilbert, our executive director, uh, and it's forwarded by myself and David Sable. Definitely check it out, available on Amazon. It's a masterclass in digital advertising, and uh, you'll definitely come away with some, some practical uh, advice and techniques for increasing the profitability of your digital advertising campaigns. Today we have a special guest, uh, Julian Juniman, um, who we'll give it over to introduce shortly, but uh, Julian, it's a special, he's a special guest for us. Not only will he be teaching us a lot about uh, tracking Google Data Studio, Google Tag Manager, Google Analytics, and so on, he's a real, real expert. Um, and you could tell when someone's an expert by their uh, educational content. And Julian's all about educational content. It's what he does now full time, uh, teaching people very complicated, difficult to understand concepts and platforms. And he breaks it down in a very easy, simple to understand way. And I'm not just saying that, I have firsthand experience, um, a lot of it, and so does my entire team, especially uh, across the first few years uh, when we started our agency, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. Google Analytics, Tag Manager, and Julian's resources on YouTube were, were an absolute lifesaver. Uh, eventually, we came to call him King Julian because every time we needed help with something, we would go to King Julian on YouTube. Uh, and it's it's great to come full circle here and to have Julian on the podcast. So, uh, Julian, thank you for joining us and for taking the time. Spend a couple minutes just just talking about um, yourself, what you've done. You've 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 ran a couple uh, other businesses, one of which you've sold. You then went into uh, you you bought into a data driven approach uh, in marketing. Walk us through that that career path and what led you to where you are today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Isaac, and uh, I'm happy to be here and talking about this journey that I had have been going through. So when I started out, I really uh, wanted to do startups after university and that's what I um, got a couple of uh, folks together and we started our first business which didn't turn out that well so I wouldn't uh, say it's a magnific magnificent um, uh, buyout that we had there but um, yeah I, I kind of uh, exited that business and then we um, started another kind of journey in e-commerce and what uh, was the that's first business? I, the first business was actually a um, site that where we sold uh, cruise trips to people. So um, it was like a travel site uh, where you we had different offers to to book um, cruise trips. And yeah, and then the second business that we started was uh, right on an e-commerce. We sold um, high quality um, home textiles like bed linen and so on uh, here from Germany, all sourced from from China. I was not on the side of of the any of the of the sourcing or so on. I was solely looking after the um, digital marketing efforts, so building up the digital marketing team, um, doing anything from SEO, PPC, and so on. And we, I really um, found out for myself that uh, data is everything that moves everything in digital marketing. So later, when I um, what gave of, you uh, what gave you that yeah, realization sure. like what what changed and what how are you doing things or how did you see things being done that you would notice something and then you shifted yeah. or like what what happened there yeah sure um i think when we started working on uh, in in a team we really needed to scale our efforts obviously we had also vc money and uh, that needs to be wisely spent so you start building these spreadsheets out and in the end it all comes down on the ppc side for example to buy the customer um, cheaper than um, you you act oh, make more money with the customer and and buy him cheap uh, in in that sense and so we need to get an roi on our investment and that's when this whole um approach started where we were just looking at numbers in the end, right? Uh, even so on, on the SEO side as well. So when you look at your F SEO efforts or on any other efforts when you were looking into display advertising as well. So all we had to clamor to was the data and that was um, in the end the, the pow powerful thing that let, let us um, scale our approach. So I think that, that that's when I really fell in love with the data-driven approach as I, I call it. 
so yeah, um, I then also, uh, when, I, when I left that business, I started out on my own and I said, okay, I know now how this, this data works, but I really want to also be able to gather it. And that was always the big, big battle, bottleneck when uh, we were doing this data-driven approach. We, I started working with clients, but they didn't have that data because they didn't even know how to measure it in the first place. And lo and behold, uh, Google came out with this product called uh, Google Tag Manager, which makes it easier to build in this kind of tracking and use then the full capabilities of tools like Google Analytics, where uh, you don't just install one little tracking code, but actually customize your installation so you get the business data that... Um, a, a business actually needs in order to make decisions, and that's where. Okay, let's really pause. Let's, let, let's pause here for a sure. moment, N not for not for an advertisement, but just so I can clarify some questions. Sure. Walk our listeners through Google Analytics, like what that is. What do you mean when you say just a regular, you know, tracking tag? What is a tag? Explain what a tag mm -hmm. is, and then what is Google Tag Manager specifically? And, and give an example or two of how using Google Tag Manager uh, cu helps customize or make better. Google Analytics, like how do they work together? Sure. Give a few examples. Sure, so everybody's familiar with Google Analytics. They have it running on their website. And normally when you first open up an account with Google Analytics, you need to install a little bit of JavaScript code. And these are these uh, ominous JavaScript codes that need to be placed on all the sites of your website. And these are also referred to as marketing tags. Now, normally these marketing tags are, um, yeah, they are, you just install one tag for Google Analytics, for example. But once you start ramping up your digital advertising, there might be a tag that you need to install from Google Ads, from Facebook, the Facebook Pixel, um, from any other marketing platform uh, that is running on your website because they also need that data to operate. And um, this is always an approach of uh, taking that code and placing it on the website. Now, if you are not the one who is actually placing the code, you will go over to your developer, to the IT department to build that in. Obviously, the IT department is not always the um, most, well, it's not fastest, the most exciting fastest thing. To to fastest to respond. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's, it's not the most exciting thing to place a marketing tag on the website. And therefore, um, Google, as they also rely on that data, came up with this little tool that makes it easier to implement these tags. And Google Tag Manager is basically a tool that you install once on your website. So you still need to install one um, central snippet. But then through this uh, central user interface, so it's, it's not programming really, it's, it's a user interface that you log into, you can place these tags and they have all kinds of templates so you don't have to really actually um, uh, mess with the code in itself. So it's easy to install these tags and manage them um, on a central interface. And this makes it easy, obviously, for other companies to come in and also um, install their tracking if, if you hire a PPC agency, for example. Now, when I talk about before, Google Analytics... Bef sure? Before Tag Manager came out, there, were there some other tag management tag management platforms already that existed? Yeah, there, there were some um, plat uh, platforms that existed, um, like uh, Insighton, for example, Tag Commander, but um, these were always in the enterprise. So Google Tag Manager and Google with their power, they, they made it actually for free and you can install it on the page and it's now a standard on, on the site. Okay, but it. Um, when it comes to, to Google Analytics, when I say you install one code, you actually just get one piece of information. And that piece of information is kind of when the user visits the website and um, you get information about what the website is, uh, what the URL is, maybe the page title, anything that the, the um, tracking code can read by itself. But Google Analytics is actually a platform that you can customize and make more powerful because Google Analytics doesn't always know what your business is all about. So if you, for example, want, a, if you are an e-commerce website, you need to install e-commerce tracking. That's where the first customization, for example, comes in. And with Google Tag Manager, you can actually go in and install these customizations uh, really easily without having to oftentimes, um, well, without, I wouldn't say without, but with, with, um, relative ease rather than trying to uh, go to you over to your developer and teach him Google Analytics so he can in install it. So you can do this all from Tag Manager itself. So that's where the power of Tag Manager really comes in. What are just, what are a few, you mentioned Facebook and, and, and Google Ads. Um, you could talk maybe a little bit more in detail about those two because those seem to be very common tags or ways to customize Google Tag Manager. What are a few common 
uh, use cases for Tag Manager. And if you want to talk, you could talk about Facebook, but like, what is that? What does that mean for Facebook? So Facebook is, you said Facebook needs to operate, but what do you mean that they need to operate? Like what data does Facebook need and how does that run through Tag Manager? Right. So first of all, any PPC tool where you spend money on, they oftentimes need or they want, they need to have some conversion data. Um, if you don't have conversion data, so if the user actually took the action that you wanted him to take on your website, that might be a form submit or a buy um, of, of your product, then uh, you cannot optimize your ads because you don't know what works. So that would be the first step um, that a any kind of tool requests to get access to on the thank you page of your online store to send that data over. So the Facebook pixel has a, um, a way to send over purchase information. Google Ads has conversion data to send over. We have e-commerce tracking for Google Analytics. But when we actually don't, or w w um, when it comes to optimizing even further into the funnel, so uh, steps that lay before the ultimate conversion of the sale, you have maybe the add to cart or um, the view of the product itself, you have these different codes that you can then customize and install so you actually can track these actions as well. And with Google Tag Manager, you have these um, ways to not only place a code on all the pages of your website, but one specific page, for example, the thank you page or the product page. You can say to the Facebook pixel, okay, we have viewed a content piece here, and this is the actual content ID of um, this, this uh, product. And then you would be able to, for example, show this in retargeting advertising later on on Facebook or on Google Ads. So that would be the most common example where you would um, start customizing your codes. So, so let's go back to your story then. So you were learning all about this. Google Tag Manager comes out and you're still with the e-commerce company? No, I, no I'm, I'm already out on my own um, helping people to install Google Analytics or... or uh, getting data for them from Google Analytics and getting insights from Google Analytics, when I realized, okay, we basically need to install Google Analytics co correctly first in order, to, um, in order to get these insights. So that's when I really dug into installing Google Analytics and uh, using Tag Manager to do, to do so. Let's walk back a moment. You went out on your own, right? That's a big decision. You, well, you never really, it didn't sound like after university, you, you worked for a traditional nine to five, right? You were sort of always entrepreneurial. Yeah, um, and you you had the first company, the the cruise ship that would had you had an exit, then the bedsheet company, um, and then you went out on your own. What made you like? How did that decision come about? And at the time, like, you know, what what types of outside of work responsibilities did you have? How did those weigh into your decision? Um, and what was that period like for you? Okay, that's uh, an interesting question because I actually back in the day always remember that I love to travel and I um, w was in my 20s and wanted to uh, go out in the world again. Now at the same time there was this kind of emerging field of okay remote work. Um, now everybody's talking about remote work nowadays but seven years ago it was not really a big thing. Uh, at the same time I realized okay half of my time or probably full time <laughs> I'm sitting in front of a computer and um, doing digital advertising. I could do this from anywhere in the world. So when I went out in my, on my own, it was not a conscious decision to say, hey, let's um, be a freelancer here and try to get some clients and build a business out of that. I actually um, bought a ticket, one-way ticket to Vietnam at that point and flew over to Vietnam, sat there in a cafe and tried to figure out this kind of freelancing stuff. Um, but there was also a, a digital nomad scene um, that... Where, where I met up with other entrepreneurs, other Americans uh, from many different countries. They were all trying to figure things out for them. And yeah, I have some really cool friends uh, from back then. And uh, I went into this direction of doing my freelance thing that I built into an educational business. And many others um, went into other directions like uh, Amazon FBA and so on. So that's like kind of the the mindset that uh, the mind that I was in back then and I built this business basically from a cafe uh, in Vietnam. Wow, incredible. Um, any any big bumps along the road like as as you built yourself up? Did you have a plan for where you wanted to be? Talk about measure school. Like how did how did like what were the services that you were providing? How are you pricing your 
content where you do also doing client service um, how do you do, how do you do decide what content that should be free as far as lead gen walk us through like your strategy for building a content platform that you can get paid for and, and pay your bills with yeah so back in Vietnam it was not really um, that hard to start working on this stuff because uh, yeah you don't have uh, that many costs uh, let's put it this way and therefore when I was starting out as a freelancer I underpriced myself uh, quite a bit and just tried to get my feet wet so I went actually on platforms like Upwork and tried to do the $50 $100 jobs and just get my feet wet with analytics implementation and um, that actually turned out pretty well the, I was at some point the, the highly rated GTM expert because uh, back then uh, there were no GTM experts out there on Upwork and I could get many jobs at the same time there was a friend of mine who helped people out with this new emerging platform called Udemy um, getting courses online and I thought well I don't have anything else to do or I have a little bit of free time that was not always fully booked let me try that out and that's how I started um, an educational business but then also um, said I want to do marketing for this and I started doing a YouTube channel now on the YouTube channel side it is very important that you stay consistent and for me my marketing plan was simply okay people will buy my course after they watch a video and video is kind of like the course so it's a natural thing to like swap over from YouTube to the course so I started doing these videos um, every week and I have been doing it well, with a few exceptions every week for the past six years. And that's how it started growing and growing. And um, I was the only one back then doing uh, content consistently on Google Tag Manager and talking about this very specific digital marketing field, which is tracking and analytics. And that's how I gained a following apparently from all over the world. And yeah, um, that's how it slowly built up. I guess I was also doing some um, some freelancing work on the side, uh, especially at the beginning. I think for the first two years, I was still doing some education, uh, some some services. But I realized very early on that if I can dedicate more time to towards doing more videos or educating people, bringing out courses, I can make this more scalable in the end, right? Um, and I, my plan was never to build an agency, so I. I, uh, kudos to you guys uh, building uh, such a great agency. For me, it's it's really hard um, to to think about like, okay, I will have these employees and then we are not really in one place at the same time because I was traveling back then as well. So for me, this whole educational business was a really great opportunity. And back then it was not yet as, I guess, prevalent to have a course. Um, nowadays, a lot of people have courses and you, you need to stand out as a course creator as well. But um, back then, video was also my passion. That's why I, I started um, doing these videos. And it slowly grew until I came back to Germany uh, three years ago. And here I can dedicate more to live streaming, having a co um, complete setup here and, and, and building courses more for uh, a community that I have now grown rather than um, trying to get in every little sale at the beginning, um, which, which was more of a hustle at the beginning than, than it is now, I would say. So what is your, your core product now? So it's your courses and what's the content of those courses and, and who's your real target audience? Right, so we mainly have one product, which is called Measure Masters. It's a membership website, so it's uh, paid on a monthly basis, recurring revenue. And we have as the, the perfect member somebody who is a professional marketer that might be in a PPC field, SEO field, working in an agency, or um, somebody who is working in in-house in a business, but is doing this professionally. So they really want to understand their data better and want to know, take ownership of how to build it actually. And, and nowadays this is a crucial skill for anybody who's working in digital marketing to actually understand when a client comes in and says, okay, I will do PPC for you, but we need to get the tracking set up. And the client, especially smaller clients might not have the uh, technical expertise to actually build that in, you can say, install Google Tag Manager for me and we will uh, get it done. And that's where my um, technical tutorials also, also focus on. And we help then people to go all the way through the funnel of analytics, which is uh, at the beginning you measure the data, then you analyze it. So in, in Google Analytics, you, you have the tool of Google Analytics and then you need to make 
or uh, you need to create change with it. So data is not just um, laying around and you get great insights from it, but you actually gather it in order to change something in your marketing campaign, on your website, or within an organization. And that's where uh, presentation also comes in. So Google brought out this tool of Google Data Studio, where we also can now take that data from Google Analytics and many other sources and present it to people in a easily consumable dashboard or report. And so what, what I find so valuable about the content that you put out and for anyone else that works in PPC that might be listening to this, I think this is really important because the end client, the small business owner or, you know, the stakeholder that's hiring the agency often doesn't understand the value of proper tracking and probably won't like they don't care enough to really understand it. And I think that's okay. So long as, we do in the middle. We understand that. I think, you know, as, as your target audience, essentially. And when these things are a problem to set up, it really puts a strain on the relationship. So when we have a new client that comes on board and they say, okay, listen, you know, we're so excited to get started. You know, we've, we've gone through a sales process. They've seen our content. They've seen our case studies and they want that. They want us to start generating revenue for their business. And we say, well, oh, hang on. We have to set up tracking. We have to make sure, you know, there's a CRM integration and we want to get, you know, profit calculated in your data layer. And th that's all foreign to them. And they're like, okay, what exactly do I need to do here? Sometimes that takes several weeks, even months to set up. And, and we're saying, look, we can't do the things that we need to be able to, like, we can't do all that fun, sexy stuff until we deal with the really technical development side of the tracking. And if, if we can't, push that through as quickly as possible, there's a serious strain, there's friction in the relationship early on. So that's why I think where you come in to offer this solution is so incredibly valuable because I'm, I, I'm really, I'm, like what Isaac was saying at the beginning is not at all an exaggeration. Uh, like we're, we don't have an in-house developer here, right? So like we're a lot of marketers that either work with developers that are on the client side or we've hired a lot of developers. You know, Upwork's been a great place for us for that. But there have been a lot of times where like we're watching one of your videos to figure out how to set up a tag implementation or how to, you know, integrate Zapier or to pull this information into that platform. And it's so simple and it's really got us out of a jam multiple times where it's like I have to get on a client call in an hour and I don't know what I'm going to do. Let me go see if Julian has something on the measure school feed and I'll figure it out. So I really do think that's an interesting, like a, a really interesting little niche that you found yourself. But what I want to also kind of ask you about is this, the niche specifically. So like you, you found that there was a need originally on Upwork for people. No one knew how to install Google Tag Manager. So you were the first one to really go and do that. Then it's like, okay, well now there's people that need to learn about this. I'm going to create content. So it's not necessarily that your niche is YouTube or that your niche is you to me. I think your niche is that like you found something that is really valuable to folks like us, but there's not a ton of people like us. So as you've continued to develop your business over the years, how have you really thought about, really you were like one step ahead of the next guy that's doing it, I think. So how have you continued to think about where you need to go to make sure that you stay relevant and sharp as the entire industry has changed? Yeah, I think uh, there is an archetype here of uh, a technical marketer and there's a myth of there that, that marketers don't have to be technical, right? Um, there is, we are working with a technical product in the end. So you can't do Google Ads without installing the tracking. And I think when we look at data that we, we analyze and uh, make decisions upon, we also need to kind of know how that data came about and how it's been tracked. Uh, so we also see the faulty thing inside of the data. That's, by the way, also one of the big things things when, when it comes to automation and algorithms that of, oftentimes when we talk about the future of Facebook um, with, with the tracking preventions that are going on and so on, they will at some point not really tell us, okay, you need to Im install this data here and there. We will pull that data together and we will be able to then come up with a solution for you in terms of like the 
the, the conversion. So um, data, you need to provide that data somehow to the Facebook pixel, to these systems, and you need to know what that data is all about. So in terms of the future, I think, and how I kind of try to, or how I kind of try to understand the field that I am in, is more I see myself more as a technical marketer to understand, okay, this is the technology, what are they really offering? How is this different from um, maybe what, what Google Analytics has to offer, what, what these other tracking tools have, have to offer, and how does uh, data play a role in that, and how can we optimize this with data? I think that when, when we look at the, these, these big players, Google and, and Facebook and so on, they are clearly going into this future of automation. Um, machine learning is, is a big thing, and you need to feed the right data to these machine learning algorithms in order to get a proper output, right? And therefore, um, I think I, I try to always stay ahead of the curve and, and, and think about these principal basics, what is going in, what is coming out. Very cool. Uh, what, what, uh, what are some of the most interesting, and I want to talk about um, iOS 14 and Google's changes to a cookie-less world and what are flocks and your take. Um, before we do that, what are some of the coolest things you've done with Google Tag Manager, like outside of the e-commerce tracking? I've seen you do some really neat stuff. Um, any, any fun stories or creative workarounds that you want to share? Sure. I guess when we think about Google Tag Manager, oftentimes it, um, yeah, Google Tag Manager itself is a tool that runs on the user's browser. So it's kind of uh, installed on your website and it's executed on the, the user's browser. Now, oftentimes we can get data that is installed, uh, that, that the browser provides, for example, uh, the URL, uh, the screen uh, size and so on. But what I'm oftentimes more excited about is to pull actually data out of silos. So if you are able to pull data from, for example, your CRM to uh, Google Tag Manager and then make that usable inside of Google Analytics, that might mean that you can then segment your users based on where the users, uh, or what data you have in the CRM itself. So let's say you have data in the CRM about um, certain attributes of your users, uh, what products they use on your website or what kind of um, uh, what kind of preferences they have, especially when you're a SaaS business, the user actually logs in. And in that moment, you can identify the user and also pull in data from the CRM. And then you have that available inside of Google Tag Manager. Now from Google Tag Manager, that data, that um, identified data can be sent out to many different tools. So for example, you could send out data to a um, tool like Facebook and build a targeted audience of people who have used or viewed a certain website um, or uh, have a certain attribute in your CRM. And that makes it uh, much more powerful than the normal data that you have inside uh, of your Facebook pixel. That's how you can really build a data advantage because you have a sophisticated system that is custom to your business and nobody else um, has that data available unless they they built the same system, obviously, um, and they have that same data. So oftentimes, um, pulling data together can make it so much more powerful. But unfortunately, they're still like in silos in, in different other entities. So uh, you need to think creatively. And this is where the creative part comes in, really, in tag management or in data management, to, to pull this data together and make it useful for marketing in the end. I, I say this all the time that... Um, our clients first party data is their most valuable asset. And when you're using these platforms, if it's Facebook, if it's Google, if it's really anyone else, all of your competitors really have access to the same third party data. Like if you're bidding on the same keyword in Google and your competitor is bidding on the same keyword, there's no competitive advantage there other than, you know, maybe if your site has a, has a better usability function. So being able to leverage your own data, your first party data to help optimize more efficiently is the main advantage, is really the only advantage that's left in a world where all these other signals are sort of ubiquitous and able to be tapped into if you just create a Facebook account. Um, but I do think that like the real creative solutions, the things that you're describing here are, are only able to really be unlocked when marketers and developers can speak the same language. So I think what you just described is something that 
a, a traditional marketer wouldn't really ever be able to think of on their own because they don't know enough about the data. But a developer or a, a tagging expert would never really bring that idea to a marketer because they're not thinking like a marketer. That's not really what their job is. So do you have any recommendations or resources for how marketers could learn more about the development space and vice versa so that more of these conversations inside of organizations could take place? Right. I think that um, the, I mean, there are many resources out there to, to learn more about the development space, especially on, on the programming side. But we as marketers don't actually need to know how to build a um, very sophisticated kind of website or, or app. But what we should all be aware of, especially if you're working on technologies um, like a website, we should also, we should uh, acknowledge that there are technologies running on the website that are easily understood. We don't need to be expert in it and build them out, but we should understand how a web request actually works, what gets downloaded, um, how HTML, uh, CSS and JavaScript actually works. And then if we want, we can dive deeper into some of these concepts. So I find it very, and th this is what I've learned over the years. Um, I'm not a developer, but I've learned JavaScript through my tagging work. So uh, in Google Tag Manager, Google Tag Manager is basically just a JavaScript injection library. So through Google Tag Manager, I've learned how to, how this kind of works in, term, in terms of like if statements and what the output would be and so on. And that all helps me in the end to talk more clearly to a developer because a developer understands these kind of concepts of, okay, we don't want to um, fire something here, but we want to fire something here. We want to have this output. And as long as you, you kind of understand how he's thinking, that will help you later on in, in terms of the understanding um, the, or getting rid of this friction between the developer and the marketing team. And I think there are many resources out there. You don't have to learn to program, but at least learn how what you're working here about the website, about web development, and um, learn a little bit about how these processes within a development company maybe works. Right? So um, these uh, how tasks are actually written, and then how normally you would debug something. So the the phrase, for example, and I with tagging, this comes up uh, a lot, right? Um, if somebody says my tracking doesn't work, this, this doesn't help me as somebody who knows uh, tracking quite well. I would need to know, okay, which, uh, why doesn't it work? And how do you see that it doesn't work, right? Um, what are the tools actually to see where your tracking goes wrong? And if you can describe the output and says, I click on this uh, button, but the data doesn't arrive in Google Analytics, I, as the tagging expert, can go in and tell you, okay, we need to check these three points in order to find and debug this problem. And this is kind of like what uh, a developer would do if you have a um, app problem in, in your app or in your website. You need to kind of have the um, way to replicate the problem in order to, otherwise it's not there. For the developer, it's not there because they have no way of replicating and um, showing this this kind of error again. So that's kind of the way to, I think, um, to, to going in and, and, and getting more used to uh, speaking to developers. And don't shy away from speaking to developers. That's also a very important point. So oftentimes people come up with these weird workaround and hacks, and that's, that's very dangerous oftentimes when it comes to marketing deployment and also um, data in the end. I love the, I love the uh, Google Tag Manager preview and debug tool. It's so much fun, yes. like, you know, you're like, you're, you're clicking, you're, you're fixing it, and then it gives you like this immediate feedback, feedback. If, you're, if you've discovered a solution, you know, because you could see the data layer and, and you know, what, you know, it's, it's fun. Um, there's also the, the Chrome developer tools, like for me, a big revelation. It's like looking under the hood of, of a car, right? Um, you just need to know this, this, or you need to know how to open it up, and then you can see all this data. You can see the HTML, you can see the requests coming through, and this is all uh, valuable information to later on, if there's a bug, um, seeing, oh, I actually see a JavaScript error there. Um, that's, th that's, a, that's a huge thing for the developer, a, another piece of information in the puzzle of solving an issue. Talk to us a little bit about iOS 14. I think performance advertisers are still scrambling to figure out what it means exactly for their campaigns. If people are running campaigns on Facebook, you know, most significantly, um, what updates Facebook is making in response to iOS 14 and how does Google's 
uh, recent announcement that they're going to be moving away from keywords. I'm, I'm sorry, away from cookies. Does that? How does it play into this? Is it part of it? Is it separate? You know, try to maybe unravel some of the mystery a little bit for us. Okay, I try. I, I will not talk too much about the technical details. I guess you had an episode about this, and I uh, think it's very comprehensive. And in the end, there's always something changing. So anytime I will say something in two weeks, it'll probably be outdated. But um, the big picture stuff is that the iOS update uh, is rolling out on app devices, right? It uh, The impact is definitely there for advertisers, but first and foremost for those who are building apps because these people will not be able to take data that, that is um, measured in their apps and maybe give it to other advertisers. So the advertising pool will probably be diminished at least on iOS apps there because of this little pop-up that comes up and uh, if you want to be tracked or not. Now, so just, if, I, if I could just... Yeah. If I could just break that down to sure. even a simpler level, as an example, let's say, um, I don't know, give me, an, here's an app on my phone. I have uh, Zillow, okay, the Zillow app, let's just say, for example. So when I open up Zillow and I start looking, I start typing in my zip code and I look at certain houses with four plus bathrooms and Zillow eventually learns that I like copper trim above my stove. This is information that allows them to place highly targeted ads for which advertisers will bid more because like, oh, I have, uh, I sell gold doorknobs and I can now target on Zillow a customer who likes gold trim in their house. And that's sort of how things have worked because Zillow's collecting information about my sessions in the app and they're selling it in a way, or they're at least making it accessible to other ad networks that then allow advertisers to monetize that nuanced data. Now, if Zillow and I'm, 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 correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just, I'm, I'm, this is how I think about it. Now, if Zillow is no longer able to access the n details of my session, they don't, they don't necessarily see or, or they could, or they could sell or make accessible which homes I'm looking at, which zip codes I'm typing in, the values of the homes that I'm browsing, whether I'm in the rental market or the buying or the buying market. Then they could still show ads in their app. But those ads won't be as effective because they're not as targeted and advertisers won't bid as much on a CPM basis for those placements because they're not, the conversion rates are going to go down. Is, is that a, a good way of describing it or am I missing something? Yeah, I think that it's one side of, of the equation. Obviously, if you if you can log into Zillow and search for houses, Zillow will still have that data. Um, the end product is especially for smaller apps that are, for example, on an advertising basis, like games that, that are completely monetized through uh, advertising, they won't be able to show any personalized data or uh, any personalized ads anymore because they cannot give out that data and say, okay, this user who is visiting this game right now, I really recognize him from somewhere else. He was on Zillow before, right? So these advertisers or these, these apps will probably saying, okay, if I can't make money with this anymore, I will probably just slap on $5 and put it in the app store. And uh, that obviously then um, uh, is, is, is good for the app store because they take 10, uh, 30 percent off for Apple, they take a 30 percent cut. But this is just one one uh, coin of the, of the of the equation here because in the end, the, um, the data is kind of diminished, right? The, the data pool probably is less. And therefore, um, also Facebook and Google Ads now, uh, or Google ha have reacted, and they're changing kind of how attribution and how um, this kind of advertising works. That said, if, you, if your clients mainly are on websites, then they don't have to worry about the first impact of like the ads, um, uh, needing to to change their tracking in the in in their website because that is mainly uh, concerning the app universe right now as a big picture as a marketer how i see this whole thing is like yes um facebook has reacted pretty strongly and they have changed around some of the uh, ways to actually track users but then also um some configurations in the end, when I look at their advertising system, it's more black box now. So they, they want to do this aggregate event measurement where they, they pull in data and they will tell you if somebody converted or not. But uh, you don't really know what's going on in the background, um, what the algorithm there does. 
as a big picture, again, I don't tend to freak out as much. A lot of people right now are asking me, how do I need to react? What do I need to do? Is, uh, should I install server-side tracking? Should I um, install this? In the end, we don't know. The only thing that we would know is that the data probably will not be as perfect anymore as it was never perfect as before. Um, the quality is probably going down a bit. And in the end, what we can only do is look at our data and look at our uh, marketing and see if it's still working, if we're still getting the same conversions, or if any of these parameters are changing so that we need to adjust our marketing. And this is what we do anyways all the time, right? Um, I don't see, and this is, this is something I cannot... Uh, can I predict is like a huge shift in like, yeah, retargeting won't work anymore because iOS was uh, introduced. No, probably the, the data will be a little bit diminished, but it will still work fine and your, your retargeting audiences will still be filled and um, Facebook will still find your audiences because in Facebook, for example, you need to be logged into Facebook, right? So um, they will still be able to show their personalized ads on the Facebook feed, just like they did before. But the whole ecosystem will probably have less data available to uh, really target their users um, more completely. So that's how I think about it. I, I tend to not freak out about it and tell everybody like, yeah, let's just chill and see how it works out. Obviously, it's not um, a preferable move for us marketers because we get less data, but it's something we have to deal with. It's like the, the changing weather or um, uh, when you get older, you also have to deal with that. It's not, not something um, that is that is unpredictable here. It's, it's something that, that is coming um, uh, with the industry and um, we need to get used to it. It's the same thing with uh, privacy changes here in Europe and the US. There will also be privacy changes over the years. And um, with, with Cookieless Future, it's just something we need to like, kind of deal with. That's, that's the big thing. As a content creator, does something like this excite you? Because it, there's so much that you can kind of make out of this or to a level does it stress you out and be like oh my god i have no idea what any of this stuff even means now i have to learn about it and then you know your audience is expecting you to one have an opinion on it all but also to teach them and they want it yesterday and you're still trying to figure it out so like how, how what is it like for you sitting in the middle of all of this yeah, it's more the latter. Um, it, it, it stresses me out sometimes because oftentimes when you create content, you obviously want to have evergreen content, something that, that lasts forever. And um, with technology, when, you, when you're teaching people technology, it, it changes all the time. The problem is that the education sometimes lags behind what is actually happening. So we all know that also our digital marketing field, especially when it comes to tracking, especially when it comes to Facebook ads, is not always the cleanest industry. So there are 16-year-old uh, guys uh, on Facebook teaching others how to make a million bucks online through Facebook ads. And now they are saying, oh, iOS will change everything and this will, this will be the big thing. And now they're coming to me and saying, like, well, uh, what should I do? You're the tracking expert. So for me, it's always um, a challenge to tell people, okay, let's go back to the basics. You are getting probably less data here. And now we need to work with that data, but it, nothing will dramatically change. You will still have that data available. Maybe there will be a few more sessions that are unidentified. Maybe you won't get all the sources in. But anyways, the, um, analytics is about the trends. It's not about the absolute numbers that you see in there. So uh, for me, the struggle is really rather to uh, pull people back and, and tell them, okay, let's, um, let's look at the fundamentals here. And yes, the tracking techniques will change. And w what excites me about this is that there's new um, technologies coming out, right? So when I do technology training, I, I love Google Tag Manager and... Yeah, Google Tag Manager didn't exist um, 10, well, they're 10 years out now, but 20 years ago, uh, the internet um, didn't exist in the form that we have it now, right? With mobile devices and so on. So there's constant change there and there will be change again when it comes to um, new uh, new tracking, when it comes to a cookie-less future, right? What will this look like? Flock and so on. All these concepts that are now coming out, people want to know exactly what does it mean, but there's nothing to really explain to them because we don't quite know yet how it will turn out. And Google is kind of testing this. They want to come out with this. They're having some resistance there, but it will be a process. So we need to look at this as a news fact and say, okay, this is changing. The, the landscape is changing, but um, 
in terms of like what we do as marketers, we just need to press on and try to make the best out of what we have available here as, as data points. So that's um, kind of the thing as an educator. Incredible. Uh, one of my colleagues here uh, wanted me to ask you about what, how do you decide which content that you're going to make? How do you, how do you choose a topic? And also, um, are you thinking about any way to, uh, to take open suggestions? Uh, because we have a long list of things that we'd, we'd love for you to dive into. <laughs> well, um, on, the, on the content side, it's uh, pretty much um, not yet too standardized, I would say. It's always like what I'm currently working on, what I'm interested in, and I, I put out this content. Obviously, I know now what content kind of works well. When we have um, like content suggestions, I do definitely do take content suggestions in the paid membership because for us it's like, okay, I need to give the members what they want. On the YouTube side, it's oftentimes, oftentimes people say, hey, I want to have um, a iOS tracking tutorial, right? And oftentimes there I find that uh, people are not yet as educated enough. They just want to know the quick tips of like how to install app tracking, although it's a it's a vast topic that you can do in so many different ways and you have so many different possibilities and um, um, mechanisms to do it. So I always like say thank you for your suggestion, but um, I then don't do a video out of it just because I know that it wouldn't do well as I don't give people what they want, which is like um, a, a, a really quick tutorial on, on how to do um, implement iOS tracking, for example. So that's brilliant marketing because I think it would be easy to just be like, all right, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put out like, this is what people have been asking for. But it seems like, you know, your core audience, you know, where you're going to extract the greatest amount of lifetime value out of a customer. And those folks don't want that content because they're educated enough to know that a quick 10 minute video about iOS tracking is not actually going to answer the needs that they have. That's fascinating. Right. That's good by you for figuring that out. <laughs> Well, it's also, I mean, if you do content marketing, I, I would also look at your competition, what they are doing and what is already successful. So, um, yeah, maybe I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to shoot myself on the foot with this one, but, um, on YouTube, for example, you can see the views of any video, right? There's nothing, um, um, preventing you from going to your competitors, um, YouTube channel and seeing, oh, they have, um, hundred thousand views on this particular video, let's do our take on that, right? Um, and especially when somebody is subscribed to you, YouTube results are very highly individualized and personalized. So in the end, they will click on your video because uh, you will rank on top. It's not as as uh, on, on the search engine itself that um, where, where somebody types something in and you need to uh, really fight for that position. So me having a lot of subscribers already, I am able to actually look at a um, channel and say, oh, this guy did really well, although he has only 5,000 subscribers. I take that video and I kind of do my take on that. And that's also a technique to, to do a successful video, I would say. And the most successful videos are not always the, the ones that people ask for, right? Um, because when people have suggestions in the comments, it's oftentimes more what interests them, but not um, what will do well on YouTube. Yeah, I think probably half of the views on your um, tutorial on how to fire an event, uh, a Google Analytics event on a button click, half those views are probably <laughs> myself. Um, I've watched that video probably oh, okay. 10,000 times. So, but it's yeah, like, it's I, like a random I, obscure video that just like happened to be very useful for me at several points throughout the last like five years. Yeah, that's interesting because I, I, this is my best performing video and I redo it every year and there's actually nothing new there uh, for the button click. So I'm like, yeah, I'm um, now explaining you for the 10th time how to do this, but it tends to do always well because now it's, uh, it's a new year and, and people click on uh, new videos there. So yeah, that's how I come up with ideas as well. Um, Isaac, do you have anything else? Cause that's all. No, that's great. Honestly, this was helpful. I, I like the format here where the, you gave some practical uh, advice and it's really interesting to hear about your career trajectory because we've also been involved in content and I'm always I'm always encouraging people to go out and create high quality content it's it's great for other people it's great for business it's great to keep you sharp right if you had to make if you didn't have to make a video every week there's no way you would know as much as you do now about uh, all the different topics that you know so 
well done and i appreciate the quality of your content you look like even though you were one of the first people talking about gtm uh there's only a sliver like an infinitesimal sliver of content available online that's good that you could actually watch and now it's like oh now i could do something i couldn't do before so your stuff is good you explain it well i really respect and admire the way you teach um and it was a it was really nice meeting you and having you on the podcast julian thank you yeah thank you for having me all right, everybody, until next time, uh, don't forget to get your copy of uh, Join or Die, Digital Advertising in the Age of Automation on Amazon. Julian, where could our listeners find you online? Uh, just on measureschool.com or youtube.com slash measureschool if they want to check out the YouTube channel. Got it. That's measureschool.com, youtube.com forward slash measureschool for all of Julian's free and, and paid content and education. I couldn't recommend it more. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. And our last question, as usual, Patrick, where's the best place to hide a dead body? Second page of Google. There it is. We'll speak to everybody next week. Thank you. <laughs>